Hi, I'm Neil Austin. I'm a lighting designer, uh, primarily for theatre, doing plays, musicals, dance, and a little bit of opera, but as little opera as I can get away with because I don't particularly like it. Um, yeah, I, I've, uh, yeah, I do main, mainly lighting for that, but I have other, other lighting skills as well, so hopefully of relevance to this. I'm sure. I'm glad that you're here to speak about lighting with me and uh, lighting art. So I thought I'd begin by just kind of explaining to the audience the basics about lighting art. And there really are two steadfast requirements along with a couple of known rules. And then Neil, I thought you could come in and talk about the sort of multiplicity of unexplored possibilities within those rules and requirements. Sure. Um, yeah, so as explained in the episode covering conservations, collectors should avoid displaying artwork in direct sunlight and avoid ultraviolet light. Additionally, illuminance for works on paper should not exceed 50 lux, and for paintings should not exceed 30 lux. So kind of beginning with that, most people do not take into account the color rendering index or the CRI. And Neil, I thought you could just kind of begin by talking about your experience with color and suggestions that you might have for people in art dealing with CRI. Yeah, sure. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? You, you, you mentioned um, uh, uh, sunlight and UV as separate things, but of course the reason, reason we're told to avoid displaying in sunlight is because it has a massive amount of ultraviolet within yeah. it. So you know, if you can protect from ultraviolet with, um, uh, with specialist glasses, uh, glass that goes in front, uh, that you can massively help that, that situation. Right. But, um, so color, color can be hugely, massively, detrimentally affected in the immediate uh, because of the color perception of the brain. The fact that we have, uh, you know, red, green, and blue, blue um, uh, uh, receptors uh, in the eye and how they, how they react to what they're seeing can be manipulated in the immediate. That's what my job is really in theater when I'm doing shows on, uh, in the West End and on Broadway. I am manipulating color for the subliminal emotional effects on the audience, on the audience. So I can, I can tell an audience what to think of something by subtly uh, manipulating the lighting and they don't realize, but I have, I have affected their internal, their internal uh, uh, emotion to that. But what, what matters in the art, art world is, is um, that different sources ping different colors, essentially. So in the natural world, daylight has got, if we look at, if we imagine a graph of uh, ultraviolet, blue, green, yellow, red, infrared, that's sort of, and the visible light is between infrared and ultraviolet. Mm -hmm. And if you look at daylight in a curve, uh, it, it produces a very beautiful curve. It's a lot of ultraviolet, a lot of blue, less green, less yellow, less red, less uh, infrared. So all the heat in light is in the infrared section of light. If you could separate light from infrared, you wouldn't have hot light sources. That's why your old fashioned tungsten light bulb, the thing that the world is banning now, I think even America's banning now, although you're, not, you're a lot less keen on uh, environmental issues. Maybe that's about to change. Um, but that's why those old light bulbs were hot. They were producing uh, they were producing about 10% light and 90% infrared, which is, which is why they were so hot. Um, if you looked at that incandescent light bulb, that old fashioned light bulb, the, the thing that Edison invented yeah. uh, or stole from someone else, in fact, um, it's got a massive amount of infrared, huge amount of red, lots of yellow, less green, less blue, and almost no ultraviolet. But it's still a curve. So although... Although it's shifting your color perception towards the yellow end of the spectrum away from daylight, which is the blue end of the spectrum, every color is graduated in its response. So the eye can figure out 
what that actually really looks like. It's, um, you can understand that maybe the, the piece of clothing you're buying in the shop is looking slightly warmer green than it would do if you took it outside of the daylight, but you understand what it is because and it's this thing called the black body curve. Um, it's, which is basically uh, the way that an object heats up. So, you know, the sun is the sort of brightest, whitest uh, yeah. uh, of a black body curve. So if, if, you took a if you took a piece of metal and you pointed a blowtorch at it, it would start to glow red. Yeah. And then it would go sort of more yellow, like a fireplace. And then it would go, it would eventually end up being white hot. And that white hot is what I'm referring to as um, blue in the spectrum. And basically almost all uh, things that look natural to the human eye uh, and light sources on the human eye, so from candlelight, firelight, uh, glowing embers, uh, even further down the scale, which is sort of the red, the candlelight to the yellow through to uh, daylight and then through to sunlight are uh, they're all within they're all on that black body curve and they all uh, have elements of the entire spectral distribution every color in the spectrum is there in lesser or more forms the problem with modern light sources is they're brilliant they have managed to separate a lot of that heat away uh, a lot less infrared coming out of them but they're spikes of the spectrum so the old compact fluorescent, which luckily is disappearing. It wasn't very good for the world with mercury or the mercury it had in it. But compact fluorescence, if you looked through um, a thing, a wonderful thing called a spectrum analyzer, uh, which, which would produce that beautiful graph that I've just been yeah. drawing. If you looked at a compact fluorescent, it would be huge in the UV and then nothing. And then a huge spike of blue and a massive spike of green and then almost nothing. And then this, and so it was a very jagged section of the spectrum. To a lesser extent, LEDs are uh, the same. They're, they're becoming better. But what that does is that means that then suddenly certain colors that happen to align with that spectrum of light mm. ping and are vivid and other colors become dead. And that obviously matters in the art world like mad. I mean, it matters for me on stage as well. There was a, uh, an extraordinary um, experience we had on... Evita on Broadway with Ricky Martin, where all the military costumes uh, came on stage, having been the bolt of fabric, two bolts of fabric had been used to make it. One person had made the arms, which was then sewed onto the bodies. And it was discovered that those two bolts of fabric, despite the fact they looked the same at the dye shop and they looked the same, same at the costume shop, both of which were lit by fluorescent lights, it came under the stage lighting, which at that stage was still quite tungsten based. And we discovered that these military khakis were khaki perfectly in the bodies, but all the arms were brown. Because, again, they've been looking at this and assuming these two bots of fabric were identical and they've been in two different dye processes and they weren't. And that's the kind of problem you can get. Um, you can completely change, uh, A, what the artist looked at. I mean, we know anyway that so many things degrade over time in terms of with a reaction to UV or just age of paint. Um, but on top of it, then you can immediately put a light on that will completely change what that artwork does. So CRI, the coloring ren color rendering index is one way of um, trying to f talk about the quality of the spectral distribution of the light, i.e. does it have all of those colors making a nice curve or a flat line or anything and isn't doing spiky nonsense. And um, fluorescents were, compact fluorescents were around, uh, they had a value of 50. The ideal would be 100. Um, and you'll find LEDs are sort of, a lot of LED sources are 80% and higher. But CRI is slightly a blunt tool, um, which I won't get into the science of now, but there's a better thing called... Um, the CQS, which is actually the color quality scale, I think. Yeah, color quality scale. And that's slightly more real world in its application. It's where every source, the problem with CRI is CRI can be manipulated by manufacturers to make their product look good. Okay, okay. Whereas CQS is um, look at these 15 colors, which are very specific um, 
slices of, of the spectrum going from deep purples down to uh, down to the you know deep deep reds how does your source react to it and with that cqs uh, um, uh, scale you can you can really see actually quality of color rendering and you know why why does this matter uh, uh, it, it, it hugely better i did a show in, in in london and new york called red which was about rothko actually it was um it was about a decade ago now it was on, on Broadway and it ran, won a slew of Tonys. But there were on stage, there were, um, there were some faked, with, with permission, some faked uh, Rothko's halfway through being painted because the idea of the play was uh, Rothko had a new assistant and you followed the, him and his new assistant across six scenes, across six years and, or whatever it was. And slowly the assistant goes from being... Um, uh, you know, know nothing and keen and, and and doting on every word of Rothko's to um, absolutely killing the father and uh, and moving on as um, as I think everybody in the art world knows. There's always someone coming up behind you who is going to do it better and more interestingly than you have and will make you utterly redundant. But as part of that show, the the canvases that were put on on the easel for each uh, scene and the whole set was based on Rothko's. Um, Bowery studio, yeah. um, where he famously kept uh, the light under huge, huge control. He, he um, would block up windows in, in all of his spaces and would, there are photographs of him actually using this thing called a scoop, which was an old theatrical floodlight. It's what you used to throw light at, um, at, at big um, cloths in old-fashioned theatre and he there are photographs of him with those in his studio uh, bouncing them off the ceiling uh, actually so he's getting nice uh, indirect light so we, we used all of, all of those sort of ideas so it was a very darkened space and he was lighting with these theatre lights but in amongst it I would focus unbeknownst to the audience uh, different coloured lights onto the canvases so as he was getting all poetic with John Logan's wonderful writing I could manipulate the sense of what that painting was, and they were essentially they, they were all um, they were all the Seagram murals. So they're all that sort of um, that, that's what the play was about. He, he, it was his commission for um, Johnson for the for the Seagram murals in the, in the restaurant at the top of um, what was it? It was the Four Seasons, wasn't it? I can't remember. They were, it's gone now, hasn't it? Um, and in fact, in fact, he didn't ever give those, did he? He gave those, as, as your, your audience will know, to, well, one set of them to the Tate, and I don't know where the other set went, but there's a set, set here in London. Um, but it's, essentially, it's blacks and reds and purples. And so I had, a, I had a white tungsten light, an open white tungsten light, so quite yellowy, and I also had a very red light, and they were identically focused just into the canvas. They didn't spill over. No one really knew. So you could make it feel entirely natural to the rest of the scene, but at moments where you needed a poetic sort of uh, exaggeration uh, of the moment. You could close down on Alfred Molina playing Rothko and you could pull the painting out. But also within that, you could then put more red into it or more white. And two, uh, two acquaintances, uh, friends at the time, uh, uh, Norman Rosenthal, who was Secretary of Exhibitions at the uh, Royal Academy, uh, he came with his wife, Manuela, um, Manuela Mena. The, um, uh, what is she? She's, um, uh, she's a... She's senior curator at the Prado and also the Goya expert. And I think the two of them slightly had their mind blown by the amount of difference lighting could make to a canvas and to your perception of what that canvas looked like. Yeah. And Manuela was talking about wanting to do um, uh, an exhibition at the Prado together to display the black Goyas yeah. under something emulating candlelight because I think if I've got it right and I remember and excuse me if I got it wrong but I think because of the amount of carbon deposits in uh, on the walls where they, they strip those black goyas uh, from they know that he was painting essentially mainly at night or under candlelight and therefore what was it that he was seeing she suddenly she suddenly had this wonderful moment of what what could yeah. what could we not be seeing that he saw how should we be actually because we we tend to think that you know a flat bl white light would be the correct thing to do, and maybe it's not. Maybe actually, what we're doing in all these modern galleries is emulating daylight, and maybe actually, you know, certainly in London, if you go back to Georgian 
times and you think about and the area I'm in is, is, is quite uh, is quite Georgian and Hogarth lived around here and Dickens did and you think well those houses were quite dark and they were full of firelight and candlelight and most of those canvases would have been seen under in very different environments to the way we're now displaying them. So. Yeah I even think you could kind of consider the way that artists might be able to in the future have much more stipulation about the way that their works are lit. Maybe someone would say yes uh, I would really like my painting because of the way that I have such an impasto in it. It's very thick. I'd like for the light to, you know, have this tent to it. Oh, exactly. I mean, you know, Rothko did that himself. He did that to, to, to the nth degree by going, no, you're going to build a building, the Rothko Chapel in Houston. And that, and I, you know, there, thereby he was um, stipulating exactly what uh, lighting you would always see his paintings underneath it. It's, I mean, it's, it's not dissimilar to um, uh, the specificity of James Turrell or someone like that. You know, when you look at, look at how Turrell talks about how to recreate his pieces, you know, some of those pieces are now very, very old, but when you're recreating a gallery, you're creating with modern, you know, it, it's, pretty, it's pretty obvious what's going on and why it's working. And, and one of the things I've seen go slightly wrong uh, with those is... Um, that he would have again been using, he, he used very low level tungsten lights. Some of his, I, I wish I knew the names of them, you'll know. But you know, the kind of, um, the, the apertures in an end of a gallery wall that, that turn out, that feel like it's painting and turns out it's yeah, negative, yeah, yeah. those kind of ones. But in order to keep that glowing, he would focus little cans of light with a tungsten light bulb at sort of 20 or 30%. Um, at the side walls to make sure that there was, well, I would say to make sure that there was color contrast, because if he's got a blue uh, in the image at the end, the tungsten, which is yellow, like, you know, these are all tungsten lamps behind me here, you know, the classic, classic light bulb, that's, that's keeping your eye balanced to white being somewhere between that yellow and this blue. If I'm only going into a room and I'm seeing just blue, the eye is amazing at rebalancing and then assuming that blue is actually natural, central, white. So you've seen all sorts of light artists work where you go into one room that's pink. Yeah. And then you go into the next room that's green and it doesn't appear green because your eye is so shifted into the pink end of the spectrum that it's seeing entirely different entirely different images. It's something we sometimes play with in, in, um, in light as well. I mean, you know, Tur Turrell also, I think occasionally, dare I say, gets some stuff wrong. I've seen, seen an exhibition of his where he plays with, very early, some of his early work was playing with um, corner shapes in yeah. a room where you walk into the room and they appear to, uses the apex of the wall, the corner of the wall, to ping towards you. But of course, that, for me, theoretically works brilliantly with a red, right. which naturally in your mind is a forward and advancing color. Okay. But with a blue, I find they don't work very well at all because the brain has less blue receptors. We're very used to as humans having blue as a dominant but recessive color, hence we have less receptors, but also we're always used to blue being the sky. Blue is the distance. And so you can play tricks like this on stage sometimes. If you have a blue wall with a red chair in front of it, the red chair appears to be much further towards you than the blue wall. But if you did the opposite, if you had a red wall with a blue chair in front of it, it would, in your mind, be slightly difficult yeah. to judge that distance. So, anyway. Goodness, God, we got onto an awful lot of art and an awful lot of colour rendering there. But yes, colour rendering is, in, is important. The quality of colour rendering, so rendering is important. What do you find, if, if you're looking, let's say you don't have any direction from an artist and you're looking to kind of enhance the colours, colour quality scale? Is that what it is, colour? Yeah, the C, uh, CQS, yeah, yeah. CQS. How do you find that information? Like, if you went to a lighting store, can you find it? Mm. I mean... Yeah, uh, that, that is, that, 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 that's the really hard thing. I mean, this is why I'm afraid architectural lighting designers exist. Um, it's, this is their, their world. I mean, when you were talking about 50 and 30 lux, I was sitting here thinking, God, I never deal in that because I only ever deal with what the eye sees. And so it's up to me to decide whether or not, you know, I go and sit in a, 
in a seat at the very back of the theatre and a seat in the front of the theatre and I choose a balanced somewhere in between the two where the person at the back of the theatre isn't annoyed with me that it's too dark and the person in the front is still getting an interesting enough image. So, yeah, yeah, uh, you know, this is why architectural lighting designers exist. They, they, they can help find those quality, yeah. uh, quality sources. Okay, I think that's, that's a good tip. Sorry, I'm, I, you know, I, I have enough trouble myself. I'm stuck here in my own house with, with tungsten light bulbs because I still can't find uh, an LED lamp that to me is as beautiful and as warm and as an inviting and a, yeah, as homely. Yeah, so um, something I thought I should just bring up is I know a project of restoration that happened actually with some Rothko's um, where there was some serious degradation from mold. And instead of having the, and I, it, it caused a lack of brilliance in the color. And instead of having the painting physically restored, the museum and the restorers instead decided to use color, uh, lighting that was colored to create the impression of the brilliance that was originally uh, painted by Rothko. So as a visitor, I would look at the painting and I would see it as it was originally intended and my eye would not be able to distinguish the part that had degraded and was muted versus the part that had been enhanced by lighting. So I just thought I should bring that into the discussion because I think it's another element of lighting that can be used. Yeah, absolutely. So that's, um, that sounds like what, what, uh, what was going on was that there appeared to be a white light uh, lighting the painting and yet actually the makeup of that light was um, biased in certain directions. Um, it's, it's something quite interesting called uh, metamers of colour, which is that there are many different ways of making something appear the same colour to the eye because the eye just has those red, green and blue receptors uh, if you've got lights with more, with, with wide spectrum within it, for instance, there's a, there's a light by a rather brilliant American manufacturer, which is a theater light, but it's relevant to this discussion because that often gets used to, to, to light um, uh, in galleries. And it has uh, seven emitters. It has um, a, a sort of almost UV purpley blue, a blue, a cyan, a green, um, which is almost like lime, an amber, an orange, red, and a red. I think that's seven, anyway. And the thing is, if you turn them all on, you will get some form of white light. But it's possible to turn off the orange red, but boost the red, and get something that, in terms of the light coming out of the unit, feels the same to the eye, but can have a massive effect on the red colors on a painting or in my case in a costume. I mean, it's, it's something we have with costume designers the whole time that they have imagined their costume under daylight or whatever, and it'll arrive on stage and they'll say to you, in the old world, they used to say to you, you know, it's not really that color. And so you'd have to think about changing a, a, a gel. We used to use some, um, uh, essentially there were, there were uh, plastic filters that went in front of a light to color it. But these days, because you've got actually multiple colored LED sources in the light that you're combining back to make white, I can then manipulate it from the lighting control desk and I can say, oh, I see. So you think that it's slightly too uh, cyan and it should be slightly bluer. And so what I can do is I can pull down the cyan emitter, but boost the blue emitter and, uh, uh, and, and, and really not affect anything about the skin tone and yet massively affect what's going on on the costume. And so it's a it, it, me, me, metamorph of color is basically a different ways of making up a similar spectral distribution mm -hmm. by using and fooling the eye essentially into, uh, yeah, into, into thinking it's seeing the same whilst you're actually slightly pulling, you know, slightly highlighting. If you've got a, imagine you've got a rainbow, you know, I can, the color of light I'm throwing at the rainbow can appear to be the same, except I can make some of those colors go absolutely dead in that rainbow. Or conversely, I can really ping them so that the green is the most 
absolutely dominant color in that rainbow and feels oddly uneven. Or I can also light it so they're all even. So, yeah, metamers meta of color and how, so it's how you make the, the source. In the domestic uh, uh, and architectural world, really what's happened is someone's already decided about the metamer of color to produce white light. And that's how they've made their LED. That's um, what, their, what their source color is and what the phosphor is they've put in front of that, which is actually what's glowing in LEDs. That's what makes them uh, white. It's a, it's, a, it's a phosphor that's glowing. But in, in what chemical compounds are in there, they've chosen that spectral makeup already. But that's why one LED bulb compared to another manufacturer's LED bulb will produce different color results on your paintings because they will be different metamers of that same white light. So they might appear the same, but the reality is, is when you start putting colored things underneath, if you put, so when I say they appear the same, they appear the same on a white wall. Right. They look both white. They look like they're both the same color of white. But then if you stick something multiple colored in front of it, you know, and the obvious very extreme version is a rainbow, it will look different under one light than it will under the other because of how they've chosen to make the spectral makeup of that white light. So it's, um, oh, it's full of potential hazards, lighting. <laughs> no, but I, I think that's such a good point because I think playing with that spectrum can really help with either a painting that has degraded in color that might be in your own collection, um, or kind of knowing, okay, in this area of my house, everything else in terms of ambient light is very bright. But in this area of my house, it's quite dark. And so the painting, because of the way that my eye is playing with the other areas of the house, painting in this dark room is going to feel darker. And so maybe what I need to do is like change an element of the lighting in this room, the actual lighting, so that the colors become more vibrant in the painting. Uh, absolutely, because the eye, as we talked about when we were talking about Terrell earlier, the eye is constantly trying to shift to the predominant color it is seeing. Another restriction is that light should never be angled to directly face the artwork, which could obviously cause heat damage. And for two-dimensional artworks, the general held rule is that lighting should be angled at a 30 at 30 degrees to reduce glare adding five degrees for larger frames and subtracting five degrees highlight textures that's what i've always known to be true and that's kind of the like i said before the general rule but obviously this presupposes one light source and doesn't take into consideration ambient light so i thought you could maybe Break down yeah. some and give us some of your thoughts from your experience. Hey, it's interesting hearing those 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 rules. I'm thinking, where was that information when I needed to uh, work out how to light those Rothko canvases? Um, yeah, it's interesting you said about heat direct on. I think it's, it's interesting. Kind of like these lights that sometimes you could see them actually often at libraries. They're this sort of like long. The picture and light. They flip down, and sometimes people put them directly in front of the painting and facing it directly. Well, well and also, you know, the, tr the trouble with that was when that was a tungsten light bulb, an incandescent light bulb, that was super hot and it was very close. I mean, I sort of understand uh, lighting from an angle because it's a bit like why it's uh, colder in England than it is at the equator. You know, the sun is hitting at an angle onto a curved surface. So, yes, you're getting, you're getting less rays. I think uh, in the main, those rules, and I'm, I am purely guessing here, but uh, I, I think in the main, those rules are absolutely about reflection. There's nothing more right. annoying um, in a gallery than not being able to, or in any, you know, in anyone's collection, not, not being able to see the work of art because all you can see is a reflection of the window or a light source or whatever it may be. But having said that, you know, I get exceptionally annoyed when I go to Denoyer Museum in, in New York because there is Klimt's Adele Blockbauer and it's lit really badly because it's lit by those very same rules that you've just stipulated. And the point is, Klimt, I would suggest that Klimt designed that to be opposite a window, I would expect, because there's so much reflective leaf on the painting 
if you ever go to that museum, you'll be able to find me or you're, you'll know me because I'm the one who is lying on the floor to look at that because I want to see the reflection off that gold leaf that I'm, I'm convinced that Klimt meant you to see. And you can't see unless you get down onto the floor and get your head down to ground level where you are seeing the reflection off that light source. Yeah. So I think it depends on the artwork very much. Okay. They've completely killed his work by displaying it in the way they have. Well, <laughs> can we can make a petition to the museum? <laughs> yeah, but it's interesting, isn't it? So, you know, as ever, all rules are made to be broken. So. Yeah. I mean, and also I think what I was saying, I think it's interesting because so often people have like one life and then my kind of pet peeve is that it's, there's shadows everywhere and it's so spotlight and it just, it's too dramatic. Um, that yeah, it depends. I mean, I mean, there's not, there's nothing I'd rather do than see um, a Caravaggio uh, spotlit uh, gently against a dark room. You know, that is that's the world of the tenebrous. That's how you want to see them lit. But also, you know, you do need to take into account brushwork and build up of oil because if you're casting odd shadows from your light source that don't match what's in the painting, if it happens to be that kind of yeah. painting, uh, 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 then. You're, you're being counterintuitive to what the artist was attempting to do. So. I mean, you know, Caravaggio is the greatest lighting designer that ever existed. He is, he's the one that we all want to be as the theatre lighting designers. Amazing. Yeah, I think it's interesting because it's kind of what we spoke about in another episode in terms of conservation. And actually, the main takeaway kind of is, well, I guess one, you want to do routine maintenance, but also you just want to talk to the artist and see what are their expectations for this work? How did they intend for it to be shown? How did they intend for it to age? And it seems that the same actually comes into play with lighting. How does one expect this to be lit? How does one expect the brushwork to play in this work? Or as a sculptor, you know, how, what type of shadow do you want? What type of action do you want in this? Is it static? Do you want it to have more? fluid motion and the way that it's lit, it seems like actually speaking with the artist and having all of this written down. And even actually the conservator recommended doing like a, it's now Zoom, but a FaceTime, like an interview, a recorded interview with the artist so that you have a document of the artist saying, this is the way I'd like for my work to be understood. <laughs> I, I think that would be, uh, that, that would be very useful. It's interesting that some artists have uh, historically engaged with uh, light and others won't, won't have done. So there might be information coming from that, there might not be. I mean, it's, in, it's interesting, it's, it's back to Manuela's thought, isn't it? That she suddenly thought, well, he's painting this under candlelight. So suddenly 30 degrees and from above and full spectrum source um, or full spectrum daylight source goes yeah. out the window. You're suddenly going, well, actually, maybe it was all, was he painting with small candles on a table next to him casting light up this way and obviously they're warm and you know there's a whole there's a whole question there about should should that that be how they're displayed yeah okay so is there a museum that or a gallery that you've seen whose lighting you like um Oh, there are many. There are just you see, I've just been rather cruel and called out uh, called out a few that I uh, that I disliked. Um, I was just thinking. You know, of I, I really want to go to Amsterdam and see you because I know they've been working very hard with Philips, uh, working on new LED sources that they say yeah. are um, full spectrum, and I'm intrigued to go and see how well they are. I mean, this look, this technology. If you'd asked me a decade ago, um, fifteen years ago, this technology was in its infancy and was a disaster for color rendering. And it's got better so well. One of my problems with trying to find, you know, reasonable uh, uh, replacement light bulbs is um, that every six months there's something new out there that's even better. And it's just we will eventually reach a plateau with it. But it is. It started off being a game of, oh my god, it works. Oh my god, mine's brighter than yours. And eventually, as everyone reaches the top of mine's brighter than yours it becomes mine's better quality than yours. No, mine's even better quality than yours. And so we're getting to that stage now with light sources, with LED light sources, where they are low UV, which is great in your world, yeah. and, and high spectral distribution. Yeah. So they have a good color quality capability. So, yeah. 
it's 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 getting better, but it's uh, give it another five years, and we'll, we'll you know maybe there'll be something entirely different on the market. So. Wow. Well, thank you. Is there anything else you want to add? Oh, good question. Uh, no, I'm not sure. Go to the theatre as well as as buying art, please, all of you. My goodness, we're going to need we're going to need you to come out of the other side of COVID. Um, no, just be aware. Just be aware that that light can really really change how you perceive it and you know play with that why not 